Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Paul Harris and I'm president of the City Club's Board of Directors. I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, T.R. Reed, renowned reporter, documentary filmmaker, and author, and a lot more on him in a moment. Now at the City Club, we pride ourselves on impeccable timing in bringing relevant topics to our local and national audiences at our Friday forums. We also, of course, seek to inform and thereby improve the quality of civic debate. That's a fundamental part of our mission. Earlier this week, a new dimension was added to the ongoing dialogue and debate about the Affordable Care Act, also, of course, known as Obamacare. As a result of the Congressional Budget Office's report on the act's projected impact on workforce participation, this report came on the heels of questions about whether the act would achieve its goal of expanding coverage and, of course, breaking news and just plain regular incessant news coverage of the botched initial rollout of the healthcare.gov website. A Washington Post story published this past Tuesday suggested that the CBO report in fact contained bad news for both sides of the ongoing debate. The article stated that, quote, in an implicit rebuke of GOP talking points, the CBO said that there was little evidence the health care law is affecting employment and that businesses are not expected to significantly reduce headcount or hours as a result of the law, end quote. But the article continued, the report, quote, contained a setback for the White House. The CBO predicts that the economy will have the equivalent of 2.3 million fewer full-time workers by 2021 as a result of the law, nearly three times previous estimates, end quote. Today's speaker brings an international perspective to the healthcare discussion. In writing his 2009 bestseller, The Healing of America, A Global Quest for Better, Cheaper, and Fairer Healthcare, Mr. Reed traveled the world and studied healthcare systems. His research challenges assertions that other industrialized nations have socialized medicine, we hear that term a lot in the debate, and the notion that the United States has the finest healthcare system in the world, either in terms of outcomes or financial terms. In addition, our Princeton educated speaker has pointed out that the United States can learn from other industrialized nations as we endeavor to improve our complicated health care delivery system. Mr. Reed has covered Congress and four presidential campaigns for the Washington Post. He led the Post's London and Tokyo bureaus and has written nine books in English and three in Japanese and translated one book from Japanese. PBS Frontline produced, I hope I got that right by the way. <laughs> PBS Frontline produced two documentaries, Sick Around the World and India, A Second Opinion, following Mr. Reed as he did reporting for his Healing of America book. Mr. Reed has made documentary films for National Geographic Television, PBS, and A&E Network. He serves on the boards of the Health Research and Education Trust and the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, among other community and educational institutions and also as president of the Japan America Society of Colorado. And one final comment on our speaker's life accomplishments. He and his wife, Margaret, have been married for 41 years. I present on behalf of the City Club of Cleveland, T.R. Reed. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, I'm just delighted to be back in Cleveland. I like coming here because it kind of, I grew up in Detroit. It kind of looks like Detroit. We had a Statler Hotel across from the Athletic Club. We had some winter sun glistening on the frozen lake like you do. Uh, and I have some friends, I'm not allowed to say old friends, friends of very long standing here. Uh, I have a friend here whom I met in college 52 years ago, friends from the U.S. Navy, and whenever I come back to Cleveland, it's kind of fun to see because I remember these guys as kind of screw-ups and partiers, you know. <laughs> and now they're at the top of education and the legal profession and the medical profession in Cleveland. It's amazing to see. So fun to come. And guess what? I have been to the City Club of Cleveland before, but not up here. I was always back in the corner. As Paul said, I was a, a political reporter. I covered all these presidential candidates, and they all come here when they're campaigning. Uh, for some strange reason, nobody I covered did very well. I, uh, <laughs> I covered the campaigns of President Ted Kennedy, 
President Bob Dole, <laughs> President Walter Mondale, President Michael Dukakis, and President Howard Dean, among others. And for some, none of them wanted to be covered by me. Why would that be? Uh, and came here frequently because they address you. And what I most remember from those events is after the guy gave the canned speech, the audience ran him through the buzzsaw. That's what I remember. So uh, be kind. Uh, now, it's also uh, fun for me to come to the real Cleveland because I just left Cleveland's sister city in Eastern Europe. There's a geography quiz. Who knows Cleveland's sister city in Eastern Europe? I'll give you a hint, it's in Slovakia. Bratislava, you don't know Bratislava? Uh, is Cleveland, that one, yeah, is Cleveland's sister city. And um, it turns out the U.S. ambassador to Slovakia is T Todd Sedgwick, Theodore Sedgwick Jr., who's, who grew up in Cleveland and his family goes back, he told me, about 10 generations in <laughs> Cleveland. And guess what he did? In this beautiful home they have in Bratislava, the ambassador's home where he entertains, he took a whole bunch of the best art from the Cleveland Art Museum and moved it to Slovakia. Did you know this? <laughs> um, they, they had Ma Marcia Steele, who's the chief curator at the Cleveland Museum of Art, come over. And he has artworks by, he sticks to Cleveland artists, George Adamy, Clarence Carter, Ora Coltman, who actually I think lived in Shelby, Ohio, but that's close enough, and uh, Carl Gertner, among others. Uh, it was fun. It was fun to see that slice of Cleveland in this fairly dusty little town in uh, the Slovak Republic. So here's my advice to you. If you ever get anywhere near Bratislava, it's right, it's, it's 40 minutes from Vienna. If you get near Bratislava, go to the ambassador's house and knock on the door and say you want to see your art, because <laughs> that's where it is. Uh, anyway, now I'm back at the... Uh, at the City Club uh, on this side of the podium, and I have to say, I kind of feel like an imposter being up here because uh, I'm not an expert on healthcare. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a healthcare economist. I, I'm just, I'm, I really shouldn't be here. I'm not an expert. All I am, as I said, is a reporter. I'm an ink stained reporter who just happened to get interested in this topic and put a bunch of years into it. And I'll tell you how that happened. Here's what happened. As I said, I was a political reporter at the Washington Post and I was working in the Washington Post newsroom, which is just a really fun place to work. There's a lot of buzz and there's a lot of camaraderie, but guess what, I didn't like it. And the reason I didn't like it was because in the newsroom, you're with your colleagues, it's fun, but the boss is right down there at the end of the row. You're never very far from the boss in the newsroom, and I've never gotten along well with authority, so this, this wasn't working for me. And occasionally, the Washington Post would send me down to cover Congress, and from the Capitol to the Washington Post, it's only two miles. But somehow, that distance really made a huge difference to me, not to have the boss over my shoulder. So I was thinking, I like working for this paper. I don't like being near the boss. I wonder if I could find a way to get some distance, and I came up with a fairly drastic solution. I became a foreign correspondent and moved 10,000 miles from the boss. And this really worked. It really worked for me professionally and for our family. Um, and the reason was they left me alone. And here, here's how you do this. Um, if the desk, if the editors ever called me in, in China or Japan, uh, no matter what time of day it was, I would say, God, do you know what time it is here? <laughs> you know, put them on the defensive right away. I always thought that was a good way to deal with the boss. And, um, and the fact is, no, they don't know what time it is. Anybody here know what time it is in Beijing? I mean, you know, they don't know that. And uh, so even if they called me at noon, I would say, you know, noon in Tokyo, I would say, what, are you trying to wake up my kids? You know, like that, put them on the defensive. This worked really well. And I developed a career rule, which I strongly recommend to any young person here who's planning a career. Here's my rule for a career. Never work within eight time zones of the boss. <laughs> this worked fine for me. And we all, we enjoyed it and stayed overseas for about 16 years in various continents. And it was working fine. And guess what? Every once in a while, one of my kids would get an earache. Kids would get measles. Uh, I broke my shoulder skiing at the Nozawa Onsen Ski Resort in Japan, and we ended up using the healthcare systems in those countries. And at first, we were kind of 
trepidatious about this. We're Americans. You know, we know that we're number one at everything, and of course we had the best health care. I mean, we were sliding our kids, taking them to foreign health care. And fairly quickly, my wife and I figured out, no, we were getting fantastic care, particularly in the rich countries. Excellent care, certainly an American standard of care, good facilities, not much waiting, and get this, the bills were minute. One-fifth as much as you would pay in the U.S. for the same treatment. One-tenth, one-twentieth. Uh, quite often in Japan, I didn't even bother to send the doctor bill home to the insurance company because the postage was more than the doctor bill. Really, I'm serious. And so just as a reporter, I got interested in this question. How do they do that? How do they provide excellent uh, health care in good facilities at, at such low cost relative to ours? And so I went around the world to try to answer this question. How do you do that? And in the course of the reporting, <coughs> That's when I found the most striking fact of all. And that is, all the other countries like us, and I mean by that advanced, high-tech, free market, capitalist democracies, all of them provide health care for everybody. All their citizens, all their aliens, you're there, they treat you if you're sick. Everybody is covered, and yet, on average, they spend about half as much as we do. They cover everybody because, well, for various reasons. Anybody who's studied public health knows this concept of herd immunity. You know, if you're healthy, you're not really healthy unless your neighbors are kept healthy too. It just makes sense um, to cover everybody, but primarily they do it because of a sense of a moral imperative. The sense in all the other rich democracies is a rich, decent, ethical society that can afford it should provide health care for everybody. There's only one industrialized democracy on the planet that doesn't cover everybody. That's the United States of America. That's where we stand. And so I just got interested in this question. And as I say, I went around the world. I um, uh, wrote a book about it. I made these two films for PBS Frontline that Paul talked about and, uh, and decided that uh, we could learn a lot from these other countries, that there are things they do that we could learn. And uh, so here's what I'm going to do today. They didn't give me much time. I don't know, you know, the thing about the City Club, they, you got to run through this. So I'm going to take us around the world in the next 20 minutes or so. This is what the diplomats call a whirlwind tour because we got to go really fast. And um, all I can do is hit the highlights. And, and I just want to say up front, I, I'm going to try to be an objective reporter here. I really don't have any ax to grind for any of these countries or any of these systems. I'm going to talk about. I'll try to tell you what works and what doesn't work. And, you know, since I'm going to be a frank, you know, objective reporter and level with you, I'll also tell you my hidden agenda. I'll tell you the real reason I came to Cleveland when it was one degree out. Uh, I, they didn't give me much time here, so I got to go through this really fast. And so what I'm hoping will happen is that some of you will say, gee, gee, that was kind of interesting. I wonder if there's a book I could buy about that stuff. <laughs> That's the plan. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, there are 200 countries in the world about, depending on how loosely you define democracy, there are about 35 industrialized democracies. And um, fortunately, we don't have to go to all 35 to figure out how this works because there are various models for providing health care, and with variations, all the countries fit into one or the other of these models. And in my book, I've divided them into four models, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to run very quickly through the four models of health care. And please, uh, this is not always easy when I'm the speaker, but try to stay awake because after each model, I'm going to give you a quiz question, okay? It'll be easier than Bratislava, I promise. Uh, okay. So let's start our world tour in Great Britain with what's called the beverage model of healthcare. This is named for a great uh, social reformer in Britain, Lord William Beveridge. He was a very wealthy man. He was born to huge wealth. He was born a lord. He was born to a seat in the House of Lords. And yet the day he graduated from Oxford in 1903, he went down to the streets of East London and dedicated his life to helping the poor. And here's what he found. He found men who wanted to work, but
but they had, a, they had a, a limp or they were sick or something and couldn't go to work. He found children who wanted to go to school, but they were homesick and of course there was no treatment. He found women who were terrified of getting pregnant because so many of their friends had died in childbirth. And of course, no care for these people. And he dedicated his life to helping people, what he would have called the other half. And here's what happened in, in the mid 40s, by now, ben, uh, uh, Lord Beveridge was a great social reformer. Uh, Winston Churchill was the prime minister. Uh, by about 43 or so, it was clear that the US and the UK were gonna defeat the Nazis and win World War II. Britain was gonna emerge from the war as an independent nation. That had not been clear at all during the Blitz in the 40s, in 1940, but once it was clear that we were gonna win, Churchill was a forward-looking statesman, and he started thinking about what should Britain look like after the war? What kind of country should Britain be for the next century after World War II? And he appointed all these blue ribbon commissions to study different aspects of British life, and he called on the great Lord Beveridge to design British social services after the war. And Beveridge wrote this famous report, it was a bestseller on both sides of the Atlantic, focused mainly on health care. He was thinking of those sick children who couldn't go to school because they couldn't get out of their sick bed. And he said, health care should be government's responsibility. Providing medical care should be a government job, just like providing the parks and paving the streets, and picking up the trash, running the public library. It's a service you get when you need it and you don't get a bill. 99% of the people in Britain go their whole life and never get a doctor bill. They say to me, why would you want to pay a doctor bill? Why would you want to do it that way? Uh, they pay. They pay through taxes for this system. Sales tax on anything you buy in Britain is 20%. Uh, but of course, if you net it out, uh, they have no premium, no insurance premium, no copay, uh, no deductible, no nothing. You go to the doctor and it's free. And so they pay high taxes, but if you net it out, on average, the Brits pay 44% as much as we do for health care. They cover everybody and have slightly better health statistics than we do. In this system, in the beverage model, as I said, it's government's job. So government owns the hospitals. The docs who work in hospitals, surgeons, specialists, uh, lab technicians, they're all government employees. Uh, the private physicians, the family docs in Britain are private. Uh, they have you know, a, a doctor's office on the street. They call it a surgery, we'd call it a doctor's office. Uh, but they don't bill the patient. The patient goes in and they bill the NHS, the National Health Service. So um, uh, this is a system that works fine, as I say. They spend less than half as much as we do with somewhat better health statistics and cover everybody. Because the beverage model works, it's been widely adopted. It's used in, in Spain, in Italy, in all of Scandinavia, uh, New Zealand. Cuba is a classic example of the beverage model of government-run health care. Uh, it's a system that works. Now, here's my quiz question. Would you say this is socialized medicine? See, I think people are befuddled, and I, I find this everywhere when I ask this question. Uh, Americans don't know what socialized medicine is. We know it's bad, we just don't know what it is. Uh, but yeah, I'd say you're right, I agree with you, sir. The, the, if the government provides the care and government pays for the care, to me that's socialized medicine. Um, but, 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 I don't want you to think that big government nanny state is the only way to get everybody covered because now we'll jump over to the mainland of Europe and see the mirror image of the beverage model. This is called the Bismarck model, named for Otto von Bismarck, who was the George Washington of Germany. He was the guy who melded about 25 German-speaking fiefdoms and principalities in the heart of Europe into a new nation called Deutschland, the land of the German speakers, in 1871. And uh, he was, I don't know, has anybody been to the Tiergarten, the Central Park in Berlin? There's this 18-foot high statue of, uh, of Bismarck, and about six feet of it is the spike on top of his Prussian helmet. He's always pictured, he's a really tough looking, you know, military guy. He's what we would call a Republican. I mean, he was, uh, <laughs> he, he, uh, he, he was low tax, small government, pro-business, hawkish military kind of guy. 
But he had to build a new nation now among people who had never thought of themselves as Germans. They were Frankfurters, they were Bavarians, they were Wimeraners. He had to convince them that they belonged to this new nation and owed allegiance to the new capital in Berlin. And the way he did it was, he invented the welfare state. He invented the idea that central government should provide benefits to everybody. In 1873, he started sending uh, pension checks to people after they retired from the farm or the factory so that you didn't fall into poverty after you finished work. We call that idea social security. We got to it in 1935, but it was his invention. And in 1883, Otto von Bismarck came up with the wildest idea yet. He said, we ought to provide health care for everybody in our country. Now, in 1883, health care was a privilege for the elite. Rich people could see a doctor, not everybody. And Bismarck says, we ought to do this. And his fellow conservatives were kind of aghast at this. You know, what do you mean health care for him is nuts? And he had his arguments. He said, look, we're the biggest manufacturing power in the world. We need healthy people to man our factories. I got the biggest army in Europe. I need healthy men, young men to man my army. Uh, but his strongest argument to his fellow conservatives for why um, they should cover everybody was, he said, I think we should consider this applied Christianity. He said, we were taught to care for the least of our brethren. And if we don't care for them when we're sick, when they're sick, we're not meeting our basic moral obligation. This is Otto von Bismarck. But as I say, he's a small government guy. So Bismarck set up a system where everybody is required to buy insurance. You buy insurance from a private insurance company, a Krankenkasse, a sickness fund. There are about 220 of them in Germany today. Uh, the insurers are private, the doctors are private, the hospitals are private, and everybody's covered. Germany covers about 82 million Germans, about 16 million aliens. Uh, very good, very good medical outcomes and they spend about 60% of what the U.S. does on health care. So this Bismarck model has been, it works, as I say, and it's been adopted, in, particularly in countries that are not as comfortable with government as Scandinavia or Britain. So it's used in Germany, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Belgium, France to a degree. Japan adopted the uh, Bismarck model. In my book, I call Japan Bismarck on rice because they, they, they took it. And it works pretty well. So here's your quiz question. Is this socialized medicine? No, I think the answer is no. No, this is a largely private system. The private insurers are regulated. Uh, guess what? They can't deny a claim. Anybody here had an in health insurance claim denied? Um, they have to pay every claim. And in Germany, they have to pay every claim within three days. Anybody here have that deal? <laughs> Uh, get this, in Switzerland, Switzerland is like us, it's federal, it's many cantons, but in many cantons of Switzerland states, uh, the rule is if the insurance company doesn't pay both you and the doctor within five days, next month's premium is free. Who's got that deal in the United States, anybody? <laughs> uh, so this can work and it's not, it's private. It, it's not socialized medicine. Okay, now my third model is a marriage of the two. You remember the beverage model was a government-run system. Uh, the Bismarck model is all private. In the third model, uh, government is the insurer. A government insurance plan pays private doctors and private hospitals. This model, uh, economists call it national health insurance, was invented in uh, Saskatchewan in Canada in 1941 by a great man named Tommy Douglas who, uh, Tommy Douglas is an interesting guy, uh, Saskatchewan is a conservative wheat growing province, it's Kansas, you know, it's North Dakota or something. He ran as a socialist, he was a lefty, he ran as a member of the Socialist Party, there were probably three of them in Saskatchewan, <laughs> and he got himself elected premier, that's governor, and here's how he did it, he promised that he would provide health care for everybody in Saskatchewan. This is at a time when maybe 15% of the population had health insurance. And the way he did it was, he set up a system where everybody has to pay in every month to a government-run insurance scheme, and then you go to the doctor and hospital for free, and the insurance scheme, the government insurance scheme, pays the doctor and hospital. Uh, and this worked. It worked in Saskatchewan. 
Gradually, other provinces of Canada copied it, and by 1961, it had spread to all of Canada. Um, and it, it's a good model. I think it works least well in its home country. You've heard these horror stories about long waiting lines and limited choice in Canada. I, I think they're true. Uh, when I was there, I think they're true. And I think it's because the Canadians just don't want to spend enough. They spend about 9% of GDP on health care. We're spending 17.5% and still leave 50 million people uninsured. Um, so it can work. The, the Douglas model or the Canadian model has been used in Australia, Taiwan, South Korea. Australia has shorter waiting times for both acute and elective procedures than the US does using this model. So this model can work and sure enough in 1965 when Lyndon Johnson decided we needed to provide health insurance for all our seniors he took the model and the name Medicare from Canada that is government payment of private providers. Are you with me on this? Here's your quiz question. Is this socialized medicine? <laughs> Quasi-socialized medicine? Government payment? I know the answer to that question. I know the answer. It's obvious. No, this cannot be socialized medicine. Clearly, no, this is not socialized medicine. It's a matter of simple logic. Simple logic. You know why? Because Americans love Medicare, and Americans hate socialized medicine. <laughs> so this one couldn't... <laughs> All right, so those are the three models we find in rich countries. The fourth model is the most common. About 160 of the world's 200 countries have a model that the economists call the out-of-pocket model, which is no healthcare system at all. Here's the rule. If your child is sick, you have some money in your pocket to pay a doctor, she gets treated. If you have no money, she stays sick or she dies. Simple, brutal, it's the fact of life medical life in most of the world. If you live in a big city, you can line up at a public hospital. It may be that you know, some charity from the rich country sends doctors to your village once or twice a year, but basically you don't get any care unless you pay. It doesn't have to be money. I was up in northern Nepal near Mount Everest and there are no roads up there, so you hike everywhere. And I walked about two hours up this steep hill and at the top of the hill is this kind of squat like a garden shed or something, or like an outhouse, just a plain stucco square building. Uh, and I went inside, and that's the local hospital for about a 400 square mile area. And I'm talking to the doctor. I said, doctor, do your patients pay you? This is a very poor part of the world. He says, well, some people have money. Yeah, some people have money and they can pay me. Um, in, in northern Nepal, the kind of the sign of wealth, kind of like owning a Mercedes, is owning a yak. If you own a yak, that means you have some money. Those people can pay. He says other people, they really can't pay. They want to pay. There's some dignity in paying for a service you receive. So he says, they pay me with what they've got. Well, what do you mean? He says, well, I eat a lot of potatoes because <laughs> that's the staple crop there. When people take their sick mother to the doctor, they bring a 10-kilo bag of potatoes over their shoulder to pay him. That's the out-of-pocket model. It's the most common model in the world. Okay, so I've given you four models. And as I said, I wrote a book about this. I uh, went around the world. It took me about two years to figure this out. They made me race through this too fast. But uh, uh, um, I went, it took me about two years or so to figure out this, what was going on. And then I made a couple of movies for PBS Frontline, and I went back around the world again to do the same, to look again with the camera crew. And um, so this was, this was pretty expensive for my publisher, Penguin Press. And, uh, and as for the PBS Frontline, well, as you know, PBS is funded by viewers like you, so I thank you. <laughs> I thank you for my travels. Um, but here's the secret, and this is just between you and me and the radio audience, too. Don't, please don't tell the accountants at PBS this secret. You know what? I could have found all four models and never left home. I could have found all the models right here in the United States because we, the richest country in the world, we have them all. If you're a U.S. Navy veteran like Bob and I, or uh, active duty military, or if you, you, you're a Native American in the Indian Health Service, that's socialized medicine. Uh, the Veterans Administration medical system, where you go to a, have a government doctor, government nurse, government lab technician in a government hospital and you get no bill, 
That's as pure a model of socialized medicine as any in the world. 19 million Americans are on it. If you're a senior on Medicare, paying into a government health insurance system and going to private doctors and hospitals, well, you live in Canada for healthcare purposes. We took that idea from them, except the other countries that used the Douglas model started at birth. They don't wait until you're 65 to put you on that system. If you're an employed person sharing the cost of a private insurance plan with your employer, you live in Germany for healthcare purposes. About 152 million Americans are on the Bismarck system. When I started this work, about 165 million Americans are on the Bismarck system, but a lot of employers have dropped coverage, people have lost their jobs. And if you're one of the 48.6 million Americans without health insurance, well, those people, for medical purposes, live in Angola or Algeria or Afghanistan. If they live in a big city uh, or generous city like Cleveland, they maybe they can go down to the free clinic or the emergency room, and if you don't have any money, you stay sick or die. According to the National Academy of Sciences, 25,000 of our fellow Americans die every year of treatable diseases because they couldn't afford the doctor. In the richest country in the world, we're letting that happen. We've got them all. We've got all the models, and that's the biggest difference between the US and all the other rich democracies. All the other countries have one system that everybody's in. They've all stuck with one model for everybody. Why would you want to do that? Uh, there are several reasons. There's a book about it that explains it. I don't have time to explain it all, but the main reason that those countries think everybody should be in the same system with the same rules, the same prices, the same forms, everybody, is because they think it's fairer, fairer. Now, do you remember I told you I was going to be an objective journalist and try to be you know, straightforward about this stuff? Here's the problem. Once you start talking about if something is fair or decent or ethical or just or humane, well, we're not in the realm of objective reporting anymore. Those are subjective judgments. This is fairer. That's a subjective judgment. That's a moral judgment. And this is the most important thing I learned in my travels around the world looking at healthcare systems. The design of any nation's healthcare system reflects its basic moral values. If you say, doggone it, uh, we're a country with a Judeo-Christian background, we come out of a compassionate Western culture, we're a wealthy country, doggone it, we want to see to it that everybody who needs a doctor can have access to health care. If you say that, as most of the other countries do, well then you can design a system that, that gets you there, like they did in Britain, in Canada, in France, in Switzerland, in Germany, in Korea, Japan, etc. If you don't make the moral commitment to cover everybody, well then maybe you end up with a system where some people get the finest care at the finest facilities in the world with no waiting, and 48.6 million people are left out the door until they're sick enough to go to the emergency room. In other words, if you don't make the moral commitment to cover everybody, you end up with the American healthcare system. Now, uh, I know you're busy. Uh, it was nice of you to come hear me speak. You, uh, I know you have jobs to do and patients to treat. You may not have time to read my book. It's possible. Uh, you could still buy it. That doesn't take any time. Uh, so here's what I'll do. Because you brought me to Cleveland so I can hang out with my old, old fr friends of long standing, um, uh, I'm going to summarize my book for you in one sentence. OK? Here's the deal. If we Americans could find the political will to provide health care for all our neighbors, if we could find the will, the other rich countries could show us the way. Thank you. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a Friday Forum featuring T.R. Reed, reporter, documentary filmmaker, and author, I believe, right? Author of a book, <laughs> including, <laughs> including one called The Healing of America, A Global Quest for Better, Cheaper, and Fairer Healthcare. We'll return to our speaker momentarily for our traditional City Club question and answer period, which will give you another about 22 minutes um, to address uh, issues. 
We would encourage you to start formulating your questions now, and please keep them short and to the point so we can include as many as possible. We welcome all of you here and those joining us via broadcast on WVIZ PBS, 90.3 WCPN, and 104.9 WCLV Ideal Stream, WTAAM, or one of our many broadcast partners across the country. Broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC, and our live webcasts are supported by the University of Akron. Today, we welcome guests at tables hosted by Baker and Hostetler, Better Health Greater Cleveland, Case Western Reserve University, Corporate College, Mount Sinai Foundation, Progressive, St. Luke's Foundation, Sisters of Charity Health System, and the Metro Health Foundation. Thank you all very much for your support. Today's forum is sponsored by the Sisters of Charity Health System. Joining us at the head table today is Heather Stoll, Vice President of External Affairs. Heather, will you please stand yeah. to be recognized? Thank you very much. Today's forum is the Thomas L. E. Blum Memorial Forum on Overlooked Citizens of Inner Cities, made possible by a generous gift the Thomas L. E. Blum and Martin E. Blum Foundation made through the efforts of Joseph G. Barrick. Thank you very much for your support. This forum is also made possible by a partnership with Better Health Greater Cleveland and the Brian and Cynthia Murphy Lectureship in Health Economy, or Economics rather, and Policy of the Case Western Reserve University Metro Health System Center for Healthcare Research and Policy. Boy, that was long. Uh, <laughs> next Friday, February 14th, the City Club welcomes Congressman Jim Renacci, U.S. Representative for Ohio's 16th District. For more information about our upcoming forums, to make a reservation or to order a CD or DVD of today's program, please refer to our website, and that's www.cityclub.org. Now, we would like, as promised, to return to our speaker for his additional 20 minutes. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today are Program Director Carrie Miller and Administrative Assistant Kristen Pianca. First question, please. Mr. Reed, uh, welcome back to Cleveland. Thanks. This, uh, this Republican guy, Bismarck, sounds like a kind of a cool guy to me. Um, and I have two concerns with, with some of what you mentioned in the models. One is that uh, we're distinguishing too little sometimes, I think, between care and coverage. Although at the end of your remarks, you did mention there's, there's emergency rooms, there is some mandatory care for people who uh, have issues, but it's, it's not easily accessible. But there is a difference between providing coverage and providing care, and often we do that. The other concern I have is, is that models such as uh, those, beverage model or others, where a lot of folks are employees of the government, uh, there may be less innovation in single payer and, and government run models and, and less options for people to choose and, and, and work in different ways. So is there a way through the beverage model that you see that we could take from where we are now with the Affordable Care Act and get more people covered at an earlier time and yet with different options? Yeah, excellent questions. Uh, the difference between care and coverage, uh, we do have a rule, you know, we're just not the kind of society that lets people die, bleed to death in the street. So we do have a rule that hospitals have to treat them, but the rules are fairly limited. And, and hospitals, any hospital in America would tell you they provide $100 million, $200 million worth of uncompensated care in a year. But there are a lot of things that you can't go to the emergency room for. You can't go to the emergency room for the prescription that ran out that you need to stay alive. You can't go to the emergency room for your standard prenatal test at four months of pregnancy, which you ought to have and women without insurance don't get. No, we don't provide the kind of coverage that universal health coverage, care that universal coverage would pay for. Now, you asked about innovation, and, and uh, this is a very good question because it's absolutely true. The U.S. is a global leader in medical and pharmaceutical innovation all over the world. We are people, doctors are curing diseases using American ideas and innovation. We're great at it, but guess what? So are other countries with much lower cost structures. Has anybody here seen her unborn child uh, through a, a sonogram? Swedish technology. The hottest new technique in dentistry, dental implants, Dutch technology. 
Uh, the third best-selling pill in America, Crestor, it's an anti, uh, it's a statin against cholesterol. If you buy Crestor, it says right on the label, licensed from Shioyaki. That's a Japanese firm that developed that. So, yes, we have excellent uh, innovation in healthcare. That's absolutely true. But I don't accept the argument that we have to pay through the nose to finance this because other countries with much lower costs um, are, are also innovative. I, I got a new hip about a year ago. Fabulous procedure. I strongly recommend it if you're limping. It's really good. <laughs> and the doctor, uh, the doctor, even though he was a busy doctor, had read my book. And, um, <clears throat> <laughs> and he said, you'll love this. He said, you'll love this. This hip, hip, hip replacement operation was invented in Britain on the NHS. Uh, there are 14 million of them a year in the U.S. now, but that was designed in a system with much lower costs. So I, I disagree that we have to be gouged to support medical innovation. It's not true. Mr. Reed? Yeah. Over here. Yeah, hi. <laughs> hi. Um, I don't know if you've noticed this, but uh, I've been kind of amazed that um, some of the... Um, uh, complaints we've heard about the Affordable Care Act make it sound as though health care wasn't complicated before it passed. Like somehow the complications all happened once we passed this law. Now, I I'm an ACA enrollment navigator part-time. I yeah. get to work at St. Vincent's to yeah. do this great work. And I wish it were a lot less complex than it is. But for the first time now, we have helped to help people get insurance in lots of big new ways. But I'd like to know what your opinion is about what elements of the ACA are going to give us the best opportunity to move forward to the next stage to get ultimately to health care for all? Yeah, well, um, I, I gave a talk on this earlier, and some people were there, so I'm not going to repeat it. But uh, uh, I think the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, call it either one, uh, is definitely better than what we had before. It's going to get uh, maybe 20, 25 million Americans health insurance who didn't have it before. It's not the answer. It's not where we ought to be. It's not going to get us to universal coverage. And it actually makes our intensely complicated system more complicated. It's harder than it was before. And that's part of because of the political process of fixing health care in America is difficult. But um, it's better than what we had. It's not the solution. And it's, it is. The, the critics are right. It is too complicated. It should have been made simpler. It, now nobody can can make it simpler because it's untouchable in Congress, unfortunately. But um, uh, so my take on Obamacare, as I said earlier today, it, it's it's better than what we had. It's not the answer for the United States. Hi. Um, I my question is about. Um, I think a lot about in the event that we do agree that we want to adopt a single system. Um, you know, I think one of the burdens is that we have a lot of hands in the pot, and the necessary outcome would be that we would have to, you know, if if we, I guess, three out of these four systems that we have operating in this country would have to restructure and reformat. And right now, we have a very complicated system. A lot of people's jobs are, are, are tied into yeah. this, com and we, we are feeding on the inefficiency of having these four systems running in tandem. So. Sometimes I get this pitting fear that we're kind of in too deep, and I wonder, are there other countries or, that have been in this situation where they've had to restructure from their foundation up, and do you think it's possible? Yeah, that's an excellent question, and I think the point you're getting at is something all economists agree on. The American healthcare system, they all agree, is resistant to change. <laughs> and it resists change because there are a lot of big winners in our current system. There are people making huge amounts of money. There are more than a thousand companies making $500 million a year or more on health care in the United States. It's the biggest single industry we have. One out of every six dollars we spend is spent on health care. So they fight change because they're doing fine in the current system and that makes it hard to change. I actually took on this very question, and you'll hate me to say this, in my book. Uh, <laughs> I went to two countries which in the 1990s uh, did not have universal coverage, had complicated, fragmented, and expensive systems, and got fed up and said, this is wrong. We have to do the right thing and change. That's Taiwan and Switzerland. Switzerland particularly is interesting. Switzerland is like us. 
Um, it, it has huge international insurance companies. It has big drug companies. It had a very private, still has a private uh, medical system and med private hospitals. Uh, and lots of money flowing through their politics. We have that too. And uh, they finally got to the point, are you ready for this? Their, their insurance companies started copying American insurance companies. They adopted this. They started denying claims, you know, like American companies do. They developed this in-network, out-network business. You pick the wrong doctor and you're out of luck kind of thing. And the Swiss it got to the point, are you ready for this? Fasten your seatbelt. Where 5% of their citizens didn't have health insurance. That was unthinkable. That was not acceptable. In the United States, uh, December 31st of 2013, we were at 16.5%. But that was unacceptable, and they had a national referendum and set up this system. They adopted the Bismarck model is what they did. So I think we could do it. I always say if Americans knew how cruel our system was and how wasteful our system was, they'd fix it. Um, so I think we can get it done. I don't think we got it done last time we tried it. What we got was better than what we had before, but I don't think it's the answer. Um, you know why I think this is going to happen? Can I tell you this? You know, when you write a book, the, the way you sell a book these days is you go on talk TV and talk radio, and that, that actually sells a lot of books. I mean, like Terry Gross, you go on her show, and an hour later, you're number one on Amazon. It's amazing, really. <laughs> and uh, um, anyway, a lot of these shows are run by what you might call right-wing shouters, you know? Uh, these are conservative guys, and their audience is very conservative. And there's a guy, I bet you don't get him in Cleveland, in the, in the western United States on the Clear, Clear Choice channel, there's a right-wing uh, radio host named Mike Rosen. He's kind of a regional Rush Limbaugh kind of guy. Uh, I like him. He's done all my books. I get along fine with him. <laughs> and uh, so I went in with my book, The Healing of America, right after it was published. And, uh, you know, I got there about five minutes before the show started, and we're sitting in the studio, and Mike says, hey, Tom, great job on this book, selling like crazy. You really did a, congratulations, you really did a nice job on it. Yeah, he's a nice guy. And then the producer goes, and the red light goes on, and he says, Mr. Reed, you left-wing wingnut, why would you want to, you know, like that. He got totally into persona. And, and, uh, and he said to me, he said, look, 85% of the people in America are satisfied with their health care arrangements, so why would you want to mess everything up for the 15%? You know, I should have seen this question coming. I didn't see it coming. I didn't have, I didn't have a very good answer. And about 10 minutes later, a guy in his audience calls. Now, this, you know, this is the chorus. They agree with Mike Rosen. And this guy says, he says, Mike, I heard you ask that question. Why mess everything up for the 15%? He says, you know... 85% of the people in Montgomery, Alabama could ride on the front of the bus. So why did we mess everything up for the 15%? You see what I'm getting at? We'll do what's right when we realize that what we're doing is cruel and wrong. And I think eventually we will get there. Uh, just one comment. Uh, I want to thank you. You're very knowledgeable. This is a very interesting topic. And I would recommend you consider writing a book on this. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm delighted. So, uh, could you just comment on, um, I think when you hear about socialized medicine, the big, one of the biggest fears is rationing. Could you talk about the condition of that yes. in some of the other countries? Yeah. Uh, are you ready for this? All nations ration health care. And that's because no country, no matter how rich, could afford to provide all the care that modern medicine knows how to provide. No country could provide its citizens all these very, very expensive drugs that the uh, pharmaceutical industry is churning out these days. Everybody rations health care, including the United States of America. Those 48.6 million people who did not have coverage, uh, they maybe can line up at the emergency room if they live in Cleveland. If they live out in the country, they don't get care. We, all countries ration health care. So the question then becomes, okay, so what's your rationing mechanism? How should you do it? Because nobody can cover everything. Uh, the, uh, uh, and, and, and one way to look at this is all the other countries, all the other rich countries have a basic floor of care that everybody gets. There's a certain level of care that everybody gets. 
and then there's a ceiling beyond which they won't go. You know, at age 89, they won't give you dialysis anymore and stuff like that. In the United States, for some people, there's no ceiling at all. Our system will provide anything for anybody who can pay for it. And for 48 million people, there's really not much of a floor except for the emergency room. So all countries ration, but we ration in a harsher way by cutting off people who can't afford care. That, that would be my answer. You can't have, if somebody says to you, oh, God, I don't like Obamacare because it rations health care, all health care systems ration health care. They all do because nobody could pay for everything. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. It's a, a great talk. The, uh, if we spend 17.5% of our gross national product on health care, and if the, uh, the next group of the rich countries is somewhere in the range of 11 or 11.5%, 11 I think, and then there's plenty that are lower. And partly in answer to a couple of the questions people asked, and realizing that there are problems with each other system. In Japan, the, the hospitals who don't get paid enough are going bankrupt, That's et cetera, right. and are in yeah. horrible shape. If you were the captain of the ship, you said you were in the Navy, so that means you have real power, not the king, yeah. but the captain of the ship. Where do you think we would be in the system that you would design in gross national product? I assume we wouldn't be in the lowest, and I assume we'd be nowhere where we are, but do you think we can actually spend more than others, but not this much more? and answer the questions that people have. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely think that we could provide health care for every American, pretty good health care for every American um, at reasonable cost, 12, 13 percent of GDP. I'm sure we could do that. And if people then wanted to buy more than the basic system provided, fine, let them do it. I think the model is public schools and private schools. We pay to provide public education for anybody but if you want to send your kid to Exeter, fine. You can pay extra and get that. I think that would be the model. And I'm now coming around to, I didn't used to feel this. When I first started on this, uh, I used to say, look, any system that covers everybody is acceptable to me. The beverage model, I mean, excuse me, the Bismarck model using private insurers is probably closest to what we've got. I now think the answer for the United States is what some people call Medicare Part E. Have you heard of this? Okay. So if you look at Medicare, those are as old as, as some of us here uh, know this. Medicare has several parts. Medical par Part A is doctors, pays, pays your hospital bill. Medicare Part B pays your doc doctor bill. Medicare Part C is the term for private insurance plans that you cover Medicare patients. Medicare Part D is, covers drugs. You with me? I think the answer is Medicare Part E. Anybody heard of this? Medicare Part E. Medicare for everybody. I think putting everybody on some kind of system for your basic level of care with the private insurers able to come in as they do in Medicare and sell supplemental plans is the answer we're going to get to. And the reason I think that is, Medicare has much lower administrative costs than any of the private insurers. And Medicare is the lowest payer for most procedures. Do you remember these stories last year? The New York Times was doing them. Uh, an appendicitis, somebody needs an appendectomy. In one state, it costs $39,800. 50 miles away, it costs $21,000. And Medicare pays $914 for the same procedure. And the hospitals all take Medicare. So, Medicare is a, is a low payer, has low administrative costs. It's very, very popular. It's more popular than private insurance plans. So I think that might be what the United States gets to. We couldn't get there today with our politics, but I think that's probably where we're going to end up. And, and if we did that, then we'd cover everybody. Everybody would have a basic pattern package of care, and we'd spend 12 to 13 percent of GDP on health care. Uh, hi. I, I was wondering if you could say a bit more about uh, the setting of prices in some of these other countries. So it, it strikes me that one of the big differences that makes our employer-based model not like the Bismarck system is that prices aren't being set uh, 
by the government. You know, we have insurers negotiating with providers. And, and so it seems to me that one of the big challenges, maybe this is an ideological thing that we would need to overcome, but I think there's a lot of uh, concern about allowing government to take a bigger role in the setting of what providers get paid. And, and I was wondering if you felt the same way, but maybe you could just answer uh, more directly, uh, how are other countries who use the Bismarck model setting the prices for the care? Yeah. Uh, in all the Bismarck countries, uh, they have uh, prescribed prices. That is, the same procedure, a doctor is paid the same price for the same procedure regardless of who the patient is. Some countries, like Germany, has regional variations. The guy in Berlin gets more than the guy uh, out in rural Bavaria. But basically, they have one set price. Japan has this book. It's bigger than the Tokyo phone book. It has the list of thousands and thousands of medical procedures, six inches on the back of your hand, six stitches, I mean, versus six stitches on your forearm. They all have a price. And in Japan, they've decided that the price will be the same everywhere in Japan. The toniest neighborhood in Tokyo or some little fishing village off the coast of Kyushu and the reason they did that is that's a way to attract doctors to this fishing village because the same price goes a lot further in Kyushu than it does in Tokyo, if you follow me. Um, all countries do that. They don't all say that it's government imposed. Here's what they do in Germany. In Germany, they have a negotiation every year. The insurers, the 220 insurers, um, uh, have a negotiation with the hospitals and the doctors and they set a list of prices that everybody follows. And the way they make this work is the health ministry says, by the way, if you two don't agree by December 31st, here's the list. We're going to impose it. And they always agree on December 29th. Uh, but there's one price. And I was in Germany recently and talking to people asking me about the American health care system. Guy says to me, so uh, Harry Reid, Harry Reid, could you, could you explain, is it true in your hospital that if, if Herr Brown has a hip replacement, he may pay twice as much as Herr Black for the same hip replacement? Yeah, that's true, that's true. Same doctor, same operating room, two different prices. And they said, but, but why? Why? Can you answer that one? And here's my answer. I said, because Herr White got the same procedure and didn't pay anything for it, and they have to make up the difference. Now, try to explain that to a German, you know. That, it, so, uh, I think it's much saner to have one price for the same procedure, maybe, you know, some variation, every patient's different, and have it be established. Medicare has done that. I think all the payers should try to follow Medicare's advantage. I think it would, be, it would work much better. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been listening to a Friday Forum featuring T.R. Reed, reporter, documentary filmmaker, and author of The Healing of America. Thank you very much, Mr. Reed. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is adjourned.